Today we're speaking with Dr. Andrea Califano. He's professor of systems biology at Columbia University and founding director of the Columbia Initiative in Systems Biology. He is also director of the Schulzberger Columbia Genome Center and associate director for bioinformatics of the Herbing, Herbert Irving Comprehensive Cancer Center. Thank you for joining us. Hello. Would you discuss the impact of new integrative and systems biology approaches to the study of cancer genome, genomes, uh, which you highlighted during the plenary session? Sure. My pleasure. The, uh, the, the idea is that now we are uh, a, we're basically seeing a tsunami of data coming in from a variety of different data modalities, including both genomic and other type of omics, uh, uh, from metabolomics uh, to uh, epigenomics, etc. And what we're discovering is that while looking what particular data modality in a great amount of detail can really help elucidate a lot of the mechanisms that underlie the ideology of cancer, in fact, when you start looking at the cross intersection of these data uh, uh, modalities, the, the, the impact becomes even stronger because certain things that are typically what they call the gray zone or basically just the threshold where you would not be necessarily sure that they may have an impact or not, when they're put in the crosshatch of multiple type of different data analysis, they, they end up becoming very, very obvious. And one particular area that we highlighted today and I was in, uh, in, in my presentation is how we can start um, interrogating the networks that help the cell regulate its behavior um, through molecular interactions and how well observing the genomic data through the lens, through the filter of these regulatory networks, uh, again, some information that may be completely hidden otherwise in the data becomes very visible. In your talk, you discussed the recent results of the, in the discovery of synergistic non-oncogene addiction mechanisms in high-grade glioma and candidate targets for combination therapy. Would you please elaborate on these points for our audience? Sure. So this is actually a really exciting moment for cancer research as we discover that, um, in fact, the vulnerability points of cancer may not necessarily be the genes that, in fact, harbor necessarily the genetic alteration. It's uh, just to give you a, a, a metaphor. Um, imagine that you are a very bad guy and you're trying to pollute a river. Um, you can do so by putting poison in one of many uh, sort of uh, uh, affluents of the river. Um, and you may never put poison in the main branch of the river. Yet, if you put a poison detection mechanism in the main branch, you will always identify no matter where it is. So what we're discovering is, in fact, that cancer is the result of genetic and epigenetic alteration throughout the genome and that some of them may be in fact seen only in a handful or maybe even in just one patient. Um, but they all converge through these kind of bottlenecks and these bottlenecks constitute the, what we call the non-oncogene addiction points. And so one bottleneck, what we call a master regulator or a master integrator gene, may in fact uh, sort of coalesce uh, dozens of different genetic alteration, dozens of different al altered signals that come, that come from genetic alter and epigenetic alteration, and therefore offer you both a single entry point for therapy and a single entry point for diagnostics, which is obviously a lot better than having to go after each one of the dozens of different genes that have been altered uh, and upstream of those bottlenecks. The Califano Lab has spearheaded early efforts to assemble genome-wide, context-specific maps of molecular interactions in human cells. What implications does this research hold for the cancer research arena? I would say that this research is very complementary to what has been done right now. It essentially gives us a key to uh, understand on a mechanistic basis how all the various things that could potentially go wrong in the cell actually do go wrong in certain cases. And so it, it is a little bit the concept that if, you, if you're trying to fix a car, probably the first thing you would do is to try to get an assembly manual of the car. Unfortunately, we don't have an assembly manual of the cancer cell. In fact, there's been attempts to create sort of generic assembly manual of a human cell. There's no such thing as a human cell. Uh, every single cell in our, in our body is, is very different and has very, very different regulatory functions. So what we're trying to do in the lab is actually to dissect very, very precisely and very accurately and then, and then experimentally validate the molecular interaction that constitute the backbone of the transcriptional regulation layer, of the post-transcriptional, so microRNA related uh, regulation layer, the post-translational regulation layer, so essentially everything in signaling from membrane receptors all the way down to transcription factors, and, and finally of protein-protein interactions that are in stable complexes. And only when you really see the complete uh, sort of complexity of this entire network of, you know, of, of regulatory interactions 
and can interrogate it using the genomic data that comes from cancer observation, you can actually really understand how, for instance, some of these non-oncogene dependencies occur and how you can potentially target them using drugs. Your research to date has largely focused on systems biology with specific application to human malignancies. Can you discuss the future of this field as it applies to clinical development? Yeah, I think that we're, we're observing right now a uh, incredible explosion of interest for the IRS system biology. Was, you know, last year I, I ran one of the major symposia in cancer system biology at, at the ACR, and it looked like, you know, uh, you know, things were starting to come up. And then this year there's been a major focus of the entire conference, and as you've seen from some of the results that have been shown both at this symposium and also at some of the others that, you know, I think there's four or five this, this year that are revolving around this area, um, the, we're learning more and more that as we as we get better at dissecting this mechanism of regulation, we can use them very effectively to understand cancer. And this is not just cancer. In fact, uh, I think system biology right now deals especially well with uh, diseases that where the cell is very close to equilibrium. And actually in cancer, this is, actually, this is the case because the genetic and epigenetic alteration that uh, induced the, the transformation of the cell occur on a time scale that is much, much longer than any regulatory process in the cell. And so when you observe the cell after it has become tumorigenic, you actually observe a cell in a relatively quiescent state. There are other diseases, for instance, you know, say metabolic diseases that are in fact much more complicated because it, it is the very rapid turnaround, literally seconds turnaround between say the demand for insulin, the ability of the cell to produce some uh, as a result of sugar level in the blood that, that determines the, the behavior of the network. So those are gonna be more sort of longer term coming, although some initial uh, uh, results are, are already being shown. But so, sort of the areas where, for instance, this discipline is having already a, a tremendous effect is you know, starting with cancer has been clearly the one where there's been the broadest impact. But I would say that right now, uh, infectious diseases and uh, uh, um, neurodegenerative diseases are in fact um, very, very ripe targets. Dr. Califano, thank you so much. My pleasure.